Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today, a special one because we are joined by our friends at the ATO to talk about charity tax concessions and endorsement. My name is Matt Crichton, as it says on the screen there, and I'm from the ACNC's um, guidance and education team. And joining me today to talk about all things tax for charities is our friend from the ATO, Mel Gibbs. Hello, Mel. Hi, Matt. How are you? Very good, thanks. And you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, we're in different states, so you'll hear Mel's audio a little bit differently to mine, um, but I'm sure it won't make a difference. Um, and I'm sure the sound is coming through clearly. But if you are having troubles with the audio, um, you should be able to call into the webinar using your phone and the instructions for doing that was in the email that you were sent upon registration. There should be a phone number and an access code that you can put in and then you can hear the webinar through your phone. Also, before we get started, uh, just a couple of um, administrat administrative type things to cover. We do have a, a few people answering some questions as we go along via text. So if you have any questions that pop up as you're watching the broadcast, feel free to put them into the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And our colleagues, April, Chris, Catherine and Abdi are there standing by to answer any questions that come through. Just a note on the questions though, um, it's probably best to keep them to a, a general nature. Um, we can provide um, as good answers as we can, but if, if your questions are, are really specific and um, about specific aspects of your organization's tax obligations, we may, we may need to get back to you later via email, or it may be best to just give us a call, um, give our advice team a call who will be able to help you with just some um, specific answers for your organization. But having said that, we will try our best to get to all the answers, to get to all the questions with answers that we can. And although, although you may not be able to notice, we have quite the crowd in today. So we'll try our best to answer all the questions, but of course we may not get to every single one. And if we don't get to yours, that's all right. We will uh, make the effort to respond in email, respond via email later on. Also, we will send a follow-up um, email once we've completed the webinar, um, within a couple of days or so, which will have links to all the resources that we mentioned throughout the webinar, including a copy of the recording of this webinar and the uh, webinar slides that you will see today. So no need to frantically write down everything we say or everything you see on the screen. You will receive an email with all of that um, contained within, uh, within a few days. And we'll just get started on the content now. So we'll go over what we cover, what we will cover today. We'll have a look at just general charity tax concessions. We'll touch on how the ACNC and the ATO work together. We are different agencies, but of course, the nature of some of the work means that there is some overlap. Then we'll get to what I, I think many of you are here for is the section on deductible gift recipients. We'll cover the um, application process and, and the categories and, and what you need to know about applying for this particular tax concession. We'll then touch on some government DGR registers. And finally, as it says on the screen there, health promotion charities and public benevolent institutions, which are two special charity types that have access to uh, a few tax concessions. So we'll just cover what it means to be those charity types. Okay, before I do pass over to Mill to cover some of the ATO's role in all of this, I will just take the opportunity to outline the ACNC's role. It's important to note that the ACNC is not the um, agency that decides on tax concessions. The ACNC is the independent national regulator of charities. So the main role of the ACNC in doing that is to register organisations as charities. Where the connection with the ATO comes in is that charity, Commonwealth charity tax concessions from the ATO require registration as a charity. So you won't be able to access them unless your organisation has been registered with the, AC, with the ACNC as a charity. So the ACNC's role is to have a look at an application to decide whether or not the organisation is registerable as a charity and then the tax stuff is left to the ATO. 
And it's important to note, as the third dot point on the screen says here, that some tax concessions are available only to particular types of charities. Now, the organisation that does do much of the work as far as tax concessions goes is the ATO, and I'll pass over to Mel, who will give us a rundown on the ATO's role. Thanks, Matt. Um, so Matt's already talked about uh, the ACNC role briefly um, and the ATO's role in this is that we administer the tax systems for Australia. We then um, look after charities by endorsing them for their tax concessions and this includes DGR. So um, the endorsements and the administration of that are all done by the ATO. Um, after the ACNC has decided on charity status and whether or not you're eligible to be registered, then the ATO makes a decision on your organisation's eligibility for tax concessions. Some of these tax concessions have special conditions that need to be met, so we'll be talking about that a little bit later as well, um, and they need to be met before they can receive certain tax concessions. And a really important thing to note here is that if your entity or your organisation is endorsed for tax concessions, then these will all be visible on the ABN lookup, and that's at abr.business.gov.au, so that's a public register. Yeah, that's a really important point. I think some organisations have um, not known where to check the tax concessions that they already have online and they might come to the ACNC Charity Register or, or, or some other place, but that's the place where, where you can check. It's at the ABR, the Australian, uh, the Australian ABN lookup, sorry, at abr.business.gov.au. Um, and just on that, Mel, if I may jump in, um, once the tax, con the tax concessions are endorsed by the ATO, is the information immediately available on the ABN lookup? Um, pretty much, so there, there's generally a couple of hours lag um, or sometimes overnight from when we key an endorsement and improve it, approve it on our system to when it appears on the public register. So it's, it's not a long period of time. Okay, so no, you're not going to be waiting weeks for, for the information to populate on that no. register? No, and, and if, I think if you're waiting weeks, it means something's wrong, um, so that's when you need to give us a call and we'll have a look into it for you. Okay, excellent. Um, now, just on how the ACNC and the ATO work together. So, as we mentioned, the ACNC's job is to register charities and to um, regulate the charity sector more broadly, and the ATO's job is the tax concessions. As tax concessions for charities require registration with the ACNC, it almost becomes your 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 first stop, your first step in this process. So when you're applying for registration with the ACNC as a charity, at the same time, in the same registration form on the ACNC's website, you can apply for the charity tax concessions then and there. You don't have to go separately to the ATO. Once the ACNC has had a look at the application for charity status and it's satisfied that the organisation can be registered as a charity, the application is passed on to the ATO who will have a quick look at the um, information to make sure that it's okay for tax concessions and then endorse them. So it is a two-step process as far as we're concerned, but the application on the part of the user is just done in, in, one, in one hit at the ACNC's website. That's the way it would go for most organisations who are registering a charity. Um, however, in some cases, a charity may already be registered, so an organisation may al already be registered as a charity and feels that it's eligible for some different tax concessions or some more tax concessions. In those particular cases, a charity can also apply uh, to the ATO directly because they would have already received their charity registration. Mel, when the ATO receives the information from the ACNC after the ACNC has made the determination about an organisation's charity status, is there another uh, comprehensive review? Does it take a long time for the ATO to make the determination about its eligibility for tax concessions? Um, usually no, so I'll just talk about timing um, and the way that we get that information. So that. Um, 
we, we get information on a daily basis from the ACNC about newly registered charities. And that information that comes through is everything you've provided to the ACNC as part of your application um, uh, and maybe your governing documents and any supporting schedules that you've been asked to complete. Once we get that, um, and once we've received all the information we need to make a decision, we usually take 14 days to do that. And we say 14 days is kind of our service standard, but in most cases, if they're straightforward, um, you can expect a call from us within a number of days, acknowledging your application and letting you know that um, everything's fine. Um, sometimes we do need to ask for some supporting information. So uh, we, we would say then that we will finalise your application within 14 days of receiving everything that we need from you. And once that's finished, the ATO sends out a separate uh, confirmation to let the organisation know that it has been endorsed for charity tax concessions? Yes, we do. So our normal, um, the, the normal way that we like to help our clients is we give them a ring to let them know that it's happened um, and speak to you personally. But then we also organise a system generated notice that will come out within about 10 days of us finalising your application. Okay, so we've mentioned tax concessions a lot so far, just this broad term tax concessions. We'll take a moment to have a look at what we actually mean, what, what the details are of the charity tax concessions. Um, as it is a tax um, aspect, I will let Mel do most of the talking for this slide. Can you give us an overview of what charity tax concessions are and what um, each one of them entails? Sure. Um, so the first one we've got on that list is income tax exemption. So that, that's the big one, I guess. And what that concession means is if you're endorsed by us as an income tax exempt charity, that your organisation will not have uh, any, you, your income won't be taxable. So you don't need to lodge a tax return and you don't need to pay income tax on any income that your organisation earns or has. So that's a, a good concession to have. It's really important to note with this one that if you are an organisation with charitable purposes, the only way that you can access this concession is by being registered with the ACNC and then endorsed by the ATO for income tax exemption. Um, the next one on the list is goods and services tax concessions. So I think there's a, a bit of misconception out here. This is not an exemption from paying GST or collecting GST in any way. Um, if your organisation is over the GST registration threshold, which for not-for-profits is 150,000, you still need to be registered for GST. But this concession um, is quite broad and it, it, it alters the way that you calculate the GST on supplies that you make. So one example that I can think of now is um, organisations that might run a second-hand goods store. So if they're um, selling those second-hand goods, they have a concessional way to work out the GST that may or may not be payable on those items. So it's a good concession to have. Um, the next one there, which is one that a lot of people are always interested in and asking us about, are the fringe benefits tax concessions. So these um, split into two, basically. There's a FBT rebate, which is available for all registered charities, and that's uh, a discount on your FBT payable if you provide things other than salary and wages to staff or employees. And the other one there is an FBT exemption, and that's restricted to organisations that are registered public benevolent institutions and registered health promotion charities. So that's basically an exemption on the fringe benefits tax payable up to a capped limit of $30,000 per year for each employee. So quite a good exemption to have if you've got employees and you're providing them with um, things other than salary and wages. And the last dot point there, while this is not something that we endorse you for, registered charities are also able to claim refund of franking credits if they uh, receive those during the year. Okay, and you mentioned, um, well, aside from uh, the ex fringe benefits tax exemption, which you said was restricted to a couple of particular types of charities, which we'll get we'll get onto later, but the rest of them, the income tax exemption, goods and services tax concession, and the fringe benefits tax rebate, 
are they the sort of base charity tax concessions that um, all registered charities have access to? Yeah, pretty much. So the, and, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but the, the fringe benefits tax rebates are really only available to what we classify as institutions and they're basically organisations that have employees. So um, charitable funds, obviously they're just fun funds so they don't have access to that particular concession. Right, okay. If we have a look at the next slide, which is probably getting at the heart of the, the reason or the motivation for why many of you have decided to participate in this webinar as deductible gift recipients. Um, we'll often refer to them as DGRs. Um, so that if, if you hear us going with the initials, that's what we mean, deductible gift recipients. This is another particular type of tax concession, which is, I guess we could say it's separate from the the base uh, standard group of tax concessions we just spoke about. This is a this is a separate uh, category altogether. And Mel, I'll let you um, explain what they are. Okay, um, and you hinted on that um, DGR endorsement. It is a separate endorsement to tax concessions, so we consider it separately. And what you find is that pretty much all registered charities are entitled to the tax concessions that we just talked about. But as we move into DGR, and we will talk about it, um, not all charities are eligible for DGR endorsement by us. So if you're endorsed as a deductible gift recipient, that means that your organisation can accept tax deductible gifts from your donors. It means that they, they'll claim an income tax deduction on their tax return for the amount of the gift that they've, that they've given you. Um, we have lots of different categories of DGR. There are over 40 at the moment in the tax law, um, but each one has its own specific eligibility requirements and, and a lot of them are very specific. So they, they fall into kind of some broad categories like health. So sitting under the health category, we've got things like health promotion charities, we've got hospitals that might be operated by not-for-profit organisations. Um, there's an education category, which has things in it like scholarship funds, school building funds, um, government special schools. Um, then we have a welfare and rights category, and that's where the public benevolent institution DGR category sits. Also a category that we have called an assessor circumstance fund. So of all these 40 categories, that it sounds like a lot, but each one has its own very specific eligibility requirements. So we've got that point in there and I talked to it before that not all charities are eligible for endorsement as a DGR. And currently uh, there are only about 38% of registered charities that are endorsed as DGRs. So what, what we ask you to do when, you, when you're applying for DGR endorsement with us is to have a look on our website, have a look at the DGR table that we have that has all of the categories that are available and have a look at the requirements. So generally what we're doing when we're assessing your application is having a look that your purposes and your activities fit into those general requirements of the categories. There's a couple of really good points to just pick up within that, I think. And the first one is uh, relevant for both donors and charities, I think, which is that not all um, charities are eligible for endorsement as a DGR. For donors, this means that not every single donation that you give to a, a registered charity can be uh, taken off your own personal income tax. That's right, isn't it, Mel? Yeah, definitely, that's right. And that kind of goes back to the point we were saying before, we always encourage donors to check before they give um, to make sure that that organisation has deductible gift recipient or, or basically check before they, they claim their income tax deduction. It doesn't stop people from um, being able to give to charities that, that aren't endorsed as DGRs. Yeah, of course. And we'd still encourage people to give to whatever charity that they want to give to. But if DGR, sorry, if, if claiming back that donation on your own personal income tax is important, then this is a really uh, crucial point to um, remember is that not all charities are eligible for endorsement as DGR. The second um, aspect of that is that it's important for charities because it means that just because you're a registered charity, it doesn't mean that you can 
offer that to potential donors in saying that they can claim back their donation before tax time to, to you know, reduce their taxable income or something like that. It means that charities need to be careful to only say something like that if they are in, endorsed by the ATO as a DGR. Yes, that's right. And um, just one more point um, to make uh, is that DGR endorsement, again, it, it's decided by the ATO. So as we mentioned before, with the general tax concessions, the ACNC will decide on charity status and then pass that information on to the ATO who will then endorse the charity tax concessions. It works in a similar way with DGR. The AT ACNC will decide on charity status and the particular type of charity that an organisation has applied to be and then pass on that information to the ATO to then decide whether or not it's um, eligible for a particular DGR. And as Mill mentioned, there are more uh, more than 40 categories and many of them have rather specific requirements. So it de really depends on the type of organisation that your charity is and the activities it does as to whether or not it can be uh, registered or can be endorsed as a DGR. One question for you, Mel. Are there any categories of DGR that don't require an organisation to be registered as a charity or do they all need charity registration? There are a few that don't have that requirement and, and those are um, like specified, the, the, you know, the requirements are specified in the tax law. Um, so some, some of the categories have got a special condition on them that they are either a registered charity or sometimes they say that they're not an ACNC type of entity. So if an organisation is, is not eligible to be registered with the ACNC, there might be the opportunity that they uh, could apply to us um, and, and we'll assess whether or not they're eligible. Um, there also are a special type of DGRs, which we haven't touched on yet and they're those uh, listed by name organisations. So there, there are organisations that don't fit into the general description of, of the categories that can apply through a parliamentary process to have the organisation listed by name as a DGR. Now that, that process um, can be very lengthy and Treasury actually looks after that and they'll assess uh, whether an organisation meets their requirements before they move forward with those types of applications. Which presumably isn't such a common thing to do. <laughs> no, it's not. And, you know, I've been doing this job for a long, long time. And, you know, during that time, you, you know, the, I could count on two hands the number of organisations that, that I've seen get listed. So it is a difficult route to take. Right. And we have mentioned the categories, but we haven't told anyone where they can find them. The ATO does have a list of the categories on the website, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So we've included some links at the end of this uh, presentation that go to our um, getting endorsed as a DGR and, and the links to the DGR table and all of the information about the categories are all contained in our web content. So if you are thinking about registering as um, a deductible gift recipient, and it may be that you're already registered as a charity, you don't have this endorsement, but you think you may be eligible, have a look at the categories and see if there is a DGR category that you may fit into. And it may be that you um, need to apply to the ACNC to have your charity status uh, changed to to fit that category if it's if it's appropriate if it's applicable otherwise if you're not quite at the stage of um well, if your charity hasn't been registered have a look at the categories of dgr before you fill in the acnc charity registration form to make sure that you're applying for the right one and to make sure that your organization is one that does the right things and actually does fit into the category it does does meet the requirements as uh, determined by the, the dgr category Okay, um, Mel did mention at the beginning that there are specific government DGR registers. Can you take us through these four, Mel? Sure. Um, so there are four uh, DGR categories that require um, registration with other government departments. So those four are um, an organisation that's on the Register of Environmental Organisations, the Register of Cultural Organisations, 
the Register of Harm Prevention Charities and the Overseas Aid Gift Deduction Scheme. So the first one is um, administered by the Department of the Environment and our cultural organisations are administered by the Department of the Arts. The Register of Harm Prevention Charities is looked after by Department of Social Services and the OAGDS is looked after by Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So these very particular DGR categories actually require an application to one of these government departments for them to assess your organisation and to determine whether or not um, you, you're eligible to be entered onto these registers. Once that determination has been made, it's signed off by the minister of that department and then sometimes it needs to go off to the, the treasurer or the assistant treasurer. So it can actually be quite a lengthy process. After that sign off has been done, it comes to the ATO and then we endorse as, a, as an administrative um, thing. So I, I guess, Matt, what I just wanted to make note of, if, if your organisation actually falls into these particular categories, there is an additional step for um, applying for DGR endorsement. And, you, you know, you go through, you need to go through the ACNC sometimes and then um, apply to these registers and then it comes to the ATO. So these particular endorsements can take a little bit longer than um, what we would normally process them in direct to the ATO. Right. So ordinarily, as we've already described, um, the ACNC will endorse an organisation uh, for its eligibility to be registered as a charity and then just pass information to the ATO to endorse the tax concessions. But for these four, if, these, if an organisation wants a DGR that requires registration on one of these four registers, there is that middle step between the ACO, ACNC and the ATO. And that middle step is a little more than just a minor step, isn't it? There's, there's quite a review taken by these um, organisations, these agencies. Yeah, that's right. And it, it's really hard, I, I think, when people talk about um, applying for DGO endorsement and that it is a hard process and it takes a long time, it's usually an organisation that falls into one of these categories. So unfortunately, the, the process for that is, it, it, it's not um, administered by the ACNC or the ATO, so we have very little control over um, the length of time and obviously the outcome of those. Yeah, and it's a really good point to make because in some cases, um, an organisation may have a, a big event, a big fundraising event coming up pretty soon and they think, oh, I'll just quickly get registered and make sure that we've got the DGR in place before our event starts so that we can you know, offer tax deductible um, donations for, for donors. But if you're involved in one of these four categories, it may be that it will take longer than you had initially anticipated and it's worth um, factoring that into your plans. Aside from these four, we mentioned um, at the beginning that there are a couple of specific types of charities that um, have specific tax concessions. These are two types. One is called a health promotion charity and the other is a public benevolent institution. Now, these two charity types have access to their own DGR category. That's right, isn't it, Mel? Yes, that is right. And this DGR like category... It's like yeah, it's like it's like a bonus. So if you if you can fit into um, one of these two categories, you're well on the way to all the tax concessions that you need. The difference with these two is that the the DGR category set aside for these two requires that you are this particular type of charity, obviously. So it means that the the application stage, when you're applying to register as a charity with the ACNC you need to register as these particular types of charities. And then from there, if you, are in, if you are given this charity status, then the ATO can endorse your DGR on the basis that the ACNC has said that, yes, you are either a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution. I'll just quickly, before I um, throw to Mel, I'll just quickly explain that registration as these types of charities require particular activities and, and not not any organization can be considered one of these two um, despite 
that despite um, thinking that you may fit into the, the category based on the name of it, for example, a health promotion charity. Um, I'll look at that one first. A health promotion charity, the, the name is a little bit misleading in that it, it suggests that all you need to be doing as an organisation is promoting health and well-being generally. It's not the case. It's, it's a tighter um, category than that. And a health promotion charity actually needs to be an institution whose principal activity is to promote the prevention or the control of diseases in human beings. So even though the title is health promotion charity, if you're to, to apply for this particular type, for this particular charity type, you need to show in your application to the ACNC that your organisation is one whose principal activity is to promote the prevention or control of diseases in human beings. So it goes a little bit beyond just general health and well-being. The second one there, uh, Public Benevolent Institution, is um, an organisation whose main purpose is basically to relieve poverty or, or distress. It's It's got to be an institution that has benevolent relief as its main purpose and that relief is provided to a, a group of people that are in need of that relief. So again, the, the, the name can be misleading. It suggests that it could be a, a very vague or general category that many charities fit into. It's not actually the case. It's it's pretty restricted and organisations do need to show that they have the activities and, and they are uh, pursuing the purposes that fit into these categories. We will have a link um, just, I think, on the next slide actually, or at least coming up, that um, has fact sheets for these two particular types of charities. So if you wanted to read up on the requirements for each one, it's good to go to our website and have a look at those. But again, once you do apply to the ACNC for registration as one of these two types of charities, the application for the DGR is also contained within that registration form and then that's just passed on to the ATO. And Mel, finally, I've spoken enough about these two. Um, once an organisation has um, been registered by the ACNC as a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution, is there another uh, is there another review or, or set of questions or information that the ATO will ask of the organisation? Um, not not really. So I'll, I'll talk about the requirements that they'll need to meet. But the really good thing about these charitable subtypes when they come through to us is the ACNC has already done the hard work in looking at your organisation's purposes and whether or not they fall into either of these two categories. So if they've given you the tick um, as a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution, it's actually a really simple process for us at the ATO once that application comes through. So the two things that we look at um, uh, very broadly, uh, we make sure that your organisation has what we call a DGR revocation clause. And that's a special clause in your governing documents that talks about what will happen if your organisation is wound up or your DGR endorsement is revoked. And it makes sure that your organisation um, will transfer its surplus funds and assets to another organisation that has deductible gift recipient endorsement. So that's the, that's the first thing we look for, uh, a revocation clause. And the second thing we look at is to make sure that your organisation meets our In Australia requirements. So when we talk about In Australia and meeting that requirement, we say that your organisation needs to be established and operated in Australia. Okay? So most organisations that are set up here get their ABN, you know, they've got an, a registered address that meets that established and operated requirement for us. And the other thing we say is that it, it now you can, your purposes and your beneficiaries can be outside of Australia and still meet that requirement. So we get a lot of questions, Matt, about um, public benevolent institutions that might do some work outside of Australia in developing countries and that type of thing. So that's perfectly fine with us as long as they are established and operated here in Australia. They can use their DGR funds outside of Australia. So we check those two requirements 
um, the revocation clause and the in Australia requirement and then we endorse you. So it, it's as simple as that. Sometimes if your organisation doesn't have um, an appropriate DGR revocation clause, we will get you to go through a process to amend your governing documents and, and that part of it, that's really then up to you to get that done and then come back to us. As soon as that's done, then, then we'll endorse for you. And just on that point, generally speaking, as part of the application process to register as a charity with the ACNC, um, we would we would probably pick up something like a revocation clause if it wasn't in there. We noticed that the application included an, an application to be um, endorsed as a DGR, and we noticed that there wasn't a revocation clause or a sufficient revocation clause within the constitution of that organisation. Generally speaking, um, if it's picked up, we'll mention it, and that means that you can uh, get this aspect of it fixed up and, and ready to go before you have before we pass on the information to the ATO. So. As long as it's picked up in time, um, in most cases it is, we'll often do that so that you don't have to um, jump that hurdle later on with the ATO. And just, I think it's a, yeah. that is one really good way, Matt, sorry, that we work together, the ATO and the ACNC. If, if uh, the ATO uh, registration analysts or the ACNC, so if they pick that up at that point in time, they will raise that with the applicant um, and sometimes even talk to the ATO about whether or not something is um, appropriate or not. Yeah, and it uh, makes things easier for you guys out there registering because it means you don't have to do two things when it can be just done once. And just also the third point there that we haven't really touched on, registered charities can apply to change their subtype through the ACNC charity portal at charity.acnc.gov.au. This means that an organisation, for example, if an organisation thinks that it might be eligible for one of these two categories that we've got on the title here, health promotion, charity or public benevolent institution, and they're already registered as a different type of charity, they can apply within the ACNC charity portal to have their registration status, I guess, looked at again, reviewed to see if they do fit the criteria for a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution. And of course, if they do, then the ACNC will um, change the status, give them give them that, that status as a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution. And then the information we passed on to the ATO to endorse the appropriate tax concession. So it's not only in the case of registering a new charity where you can apply for these uh, types of these charity types and have the DGR come with it. You can do so if you're already registered and you think that your charity should be registered as one of these two because you think it does meet the eligibility criteria. We're coming to the end of the formal presentation now, um, but we just wanted to point out some of the the, the more important uh, resources for this particular topic on the ACNC website. The ACNC website is acnc.gov.au, and then if you go forward slash and then fill in the variable here, tax concessions, DGR, HPC, PBI, or charity register, you can have all the information that you need, or well, that we covered today, and have a read through it. And I highly recommend, particularly the HPC and PBI fact sheets. Have a look at them if you're thinking about applying for those charity types. Mel, can you take us through the relevant resources that the ATO has? Sure. On, on the ATO website, ato.gov.au, um, there is a, a, a whole section for not-for-profit. So at the top you'll see some tabs, there's individual, business. Um, if you click on the not-for-profit tab, it'll open up a, a nice a lot of information for you. Um, so there's some links there to some things on getting endorsed, um, information about whether your organisation is eligible for charity tax concessions or eligible for DGR endorsements. That, that link there opens up and you'll find links to the DGR cable that we've talked about. Um, the other thing that we do have for um, not-for-profits and charity is our not-for-profit news service that you can subscribe to. It's a free email update that comes through to let you know about like webinars that the ATO might be doing, changes to law, um, any upcoming reminders for lodgement obligations, all sorts of stuff. So it's a, it's a good free um, service that you can sign up for. Um, and I think really importantly, because I know we're going to have a lot of specific questions that come out of this webinar, 
Um, anything tax related, um, you can ring us on the not-for-profit information line. Our number is 1300 130 248. So the guys who actually look after that telephone line, they are the ones that uh, process the applications for endorsement as well. Um, they're all trained and they, they know the things that your organisation are going through. So they'll be able to help you with um, um, the answers to some specific questions that you might have. And just on that point, Mel, this is not the same line as the regular tax line, right? This is a particular section dedicated to not-for-profit queries. Yes, it is. So we are a team, we're based in Parramatta. Um, we're the only team in the ATO that deals directly with not-for-profits. So um, yeah, it's not the general business line. And we do have limits on what we can help you with. So we're really here for advice and to talk to you about your endorsements and do that type of thing. Um, if you've got something that relates to paying tax or lodging things like activity statements, um, you can call our general business line or you can come through to us and our guys will help you with kind of your not-for-profit question and then we'll be able to put you through to that other area. Excellent. Well, that does bring us to the end of the formal presentation today, but we've had a lot of questions come through and um, April, Chris, Catherine and Abdi have been typing frantically trying to keep up with all of them, but we figured we'd um, go through a few of them now for the benefit of everyone. And I think most of them are going to be directed towards you, Mel, because everyone's keen on finding about some of the more specifics about tax concessions. So I, I, I dodge a bit of a bullet there. Are you happy to answer a few questions? Yeah, of course, far away. Okay. Um, all right, One, uh, probably a good one. A lot of people might be thinking this. Is there any difference in tax concessions for a charity, one that has been endorsed as a charity with the ACNC, versus an organisation that's just a straight not-for-profit that isn't registrable as a charity? Yes, there there are um, quite a few differences. Um, some not-for-profits that are not registered charities may be eligible to self-assess the income tax exemption, so they don't necessarily have to be endorsed by us um, to, to do that. What we would suggest with organisations that are not charities is to have a look at our website. There's some information there about does your organisation have to pay tax? And that will take you through a bit of a decision tree to work out whether or not you should be registered as a charity. And then if not, are you one of the organisations that falls into a category that can self-assess? And just on that, what do you mean by self-assess? Self-assess, it means that you, you, the organisation, you're conducting a review, you're looking at it yourself and you're making the decision as to whether or not you're income tax exempt. Oh, okay. So it means you don't only, have to submit anything. Uh, no, you don't have to submit anything. So if you've, if you've worked out that you are income tax exempt, then you just need to let us know that you don't need to lodge a tax return. Oh, okay, right. But all the information about that's on our website and also that's a, that, that particular thing is a really good thing to ring us about if you're unsure. Ah, good point, yeah. Okay, another question that may um, that a lot of people may want answered is the rules or requirements for DGRs or organisations endorses DGRs when issuing tax receipts for donations. Is there something that they have to do? Are there some rules that they have to follow? Okay, there are some kind of rules. So yeah, right. a, a DGR is not, they're not actually required by the tax law to issue receipts. But what we kind of say is that it's, it's nice and it's good practice to issue a receipt um, so that your donors have a record of what they've given. But if you do issue a receipt, then there are some rules that you have to follow. So things that you need to put on your receipt are the name of um, the organisation or the fund that the donation's been made to, um, the DGR's ABN, and that the receipt is for a gift. So they're the three things that need to go on there. But then other information that might be useful, obviously, might be the name of the donor, the amount that's donated, the description of the gift or property, and also the date of the gift. Okay. And what about um, receipts for a special project? If, if Is that necessary? Or does it sort of follow the same rules? Yeah, it would follow the same rules. 
Um, and the and this is where when when you know someone's talking about collecting donations for a special project, you really need to make sure that that project is for what you've actually been endorsed for. So I think that's probably the good point to make there. Okay. That you, you know you've issued a receipt, but if you if you're collecting money. It, it, and though those DGR funds need to be for the purpose for, for which you've been endorsed. So if, if I can, you know, give a really obtuse example, you, you might have a, um, a school building fund that's endorsed. Now they can only use their money uh, for building the school um, and things like that. But let's say that school wants to send their kids and they're collecting money for a special excursion or a camp they couldn't issue deductible receipts for that. Oh, okay. So that, that's actually probably a really good point that's worth reiterating. The the organisation um, can only – the DGR endorsement requires that an organisation use its funds or the funds um, that are tax deductible for the purposes for which it's it's been endorsed. Yeah, it's a really important point. Actually, we do have a question about school building funds specifically while, we're, while we've got that at the front of our minds. Do, does a school building fund need to have a separate bank account? So I guess this comes down to the, the management of the funds between particular entities. One may be endorses DGR and, and the school itself may not be. Yeah, usually what we say is that a school building fund, it's one of the requirements for endorsement that it has a separate bank account or clear and clear accounting procedures in place to ensure that the funds um, are, are not used for the wider purpose of the school. There's one that we could probably both answer, I guess. Um, what happens to charity tax concession endorsements if an organisation changes its entity type. So, for example, if they were once an incorporated association in a particular state and they have a bit of a structure change and they become a company limited by guarantee, does that have a knock-on effect for their charity, uh, for their tax concessions? Um, not a big knock-on effect. So, usually what we say, if you're retaining the same ABN, so you're just... Um, changing the structure on the way that you've been registered um, or incorporated, then generally speaking, there are no um, changes to your endorsements. But if there's actually a new entity created as part of that change, then you may need to reapply for your tax concession. And I think that applies for charity registration as well. But it's probably one that you should call us about if you're going through such a change and um, be clear about the requirements for your ABN. Um, you want to make sure that um, if you need a new ABN, you want to make sure that that's the case. You don't want to have to go through the trouble of requiring a new ABN if, if, it's, if it's not necessary. So make sure you do your homework on big structural changes. Um, <clears throat> another question that specifically relates to an organisation that was given an ABN, a separate ABN that is, for their PBI, for their, which is a public benevolent institution, the type of charity that I talked about just before. So the ACNC um, has a, a separate ABN for the PBI. What does this mean for charity tax concessions? Okay, so this is um, a, a funny little bucket of, of entities. And, and if I can kind of give you a bit of a history lesson. So before the ACNC was established, the ATO actually allowed certain types of um, charities to be registered in part as a PBI. So a really good example might be a religious organisation that may have been operating like a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter. So they had some PBI activities. So the ATO used to register them in part. Um, when the ACNC came on board um, and the way that the legislation was written, that actually um, couldn't continue in that way. So we had to separate 
these um, part PBIs out and give them their own ABNs so that they could maintain that endorsement. Because the church itself, religious organisations, um, there, there is no deductible gift recipient category for religious organisations, but there is one for public benevolent activities. And that's why we issue those separate ABNs um, for those particular ones. Now, they only apply to the ones that were set up and registered and endorsed prior to the establishment of the ACNC. So it's actually uh, like a historical type of endorsement. Um, and anyone with one of those ABNs, I would suggest if you've got any questions, you need to give us a call and we can talk to you specifically about that. Actually, that's a good one to illustrate the, the the need to be a particular type of charity to get that DGR. So, for example, in, in the example that Mel just gave, a church probably ordinarily wouldn't, in its in and of itself, wouldn't be registrable as a public benevolent institution because of the nature of its activities and what it does. But a couple of the things that they did were consistent with a public benevolent institution. So once upon a time, they could have had that little part registered as a public benevolent institution. Now, an organisation must show that, that, that what it does, its main activity is consistent with being a public benevolent institution in order to be registered as that charity type and therefore get the, the DGR endorsement. And we've probably got time for one more question, but we will stay on the line to continue to answer the ones um, coming through the chat window. If you have a few more questions or if you're still chatting to someone, Never fear, we'll be here as long as the questions st keep coming through. And of course, if we don't get to your question, we'll respond to them later um, in email. Um, okay, and Mel, what what other tax concessions are available to charities? Are there any available from state or territory or local governments? Do, is that within your purview? Do you have a, uh, an answer um. for that one? I, I can kind of answer it quite broadly, I guess. So um, basically, like what we've gone over, those concessions that we've, we've talked about today, the income tax, the SBT, the GST and the DGR endorsements, these are the only ones that the ATO administers. So there are, you know, there, there may be some concessions that are available at like state or territory levels and they they might be things like um you know concessions for payroll tax or land tax or organizations that are considered to be charitable what you need to do is go and talk to those local um, authorities those state authorities to find out you know what you're entitled to um, I know I think you guys have got some links on your website as well the ATO also has some links to yep. state and government uh, state and territory regulators so you can kind of find some contact details about that but um, it, it's kind of one of those things where it's outside of our remit um, and what we're experts on so we generally don't provide advice on that at all. Yeah and it may be that the local or state government has um, a different definition of charity or they endorse in a different way yeah. so you might go, go best to go speak to them it might be that they just um, have a, a consistent view of what what is deemed a charity and, and access to certain tax concessions but it, it really is worth checking with the particular local or state or territory government and actually Mel just before you go um, there is one more because we had quite a few questions about this if you don't mind um, Will, there's quite a few questions about the DGR process. Um, as we've described, it can be quite lengthy and cumbersome involving multiple agencies. Will there be any reform to DGR arrangements and will the application for DGR status be made simpler and what role will both of us, ACNC and ATO, play in that? So quite a, a, a big question and I think this person might have had some access to some information too from Treasury recently. Yeah, so uh, this is quite an exciting time, I think, for not-for-profits and charities because Treasury has um, just recently, in the last few weeks, released a DGR reform discussion paper. So in that paper, there are several reform opportunities that um, the, the government is looking at. And they do, uh, one of the big things there is about administration of the registers and um, how that will look coming uh, going forward. 
um, and also several other reforms around, I think a lot of it is about cutting red tape for charities and um, giving people access to um, DGR endorsement. So this is something we can't really um, talk about it at the moment because we don't know what's happening. It's just in its discussion mode at the moment. But the public has been invited to contribute submissions to that and that um, the, the comments uh, time to, to, um, to provide a submission has been extended until um, I think the 4th of August. So all of the information about that um, DGR reform package is available on Treasury's website. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, uh, you know, you, you're part of a, an, an organisation that's interested in making comment, um, the public has been invited to contribute to that. Yeah, we might include a link actually. Yeah, we might include a link to that page on the Treasury website because as you mentioned that the the date the submission deadline date has been extended. So there is a chance for organizations that have a view on this to make a submission to Treasury. Um, have a look at the the proposals in the paper, make a submission to Treasury and um, make your voice heard. As far as I know, the submissions are made public. Um, so you, you uh, I could be wrong on this, but as far as I know, they're made public, so you could go on to the website and have a look at some of the pub uh, submissions that have been published. I do know that the ACNC has um, provided a submission too, so if, if, if ours is on there, feel free to download it and have a look at it. Um, but if you are interested in DGR uh, reform or the way in which it should be changed or to have a look at the, the proposals within the paper on the Treasury website, please do so and maybe even take the time to make a submission yourself. Okay, I think that's about all the time we have for today. We're pushing one o'clock already. I know there's a lot to get through and I know that there's been a lot of questions come through about some of the specifics about particular organisation situations. As I said, we will try our best to get to all the questions that we can and in some cases it may be better for you to give us a call or the ATO's not-for-profit info line a call to, to talk to someone about some of the issues you're facing. The information um, that we've just shown you on this slide, the ATO resources, and I'll go back, the ACNC resources will be in the follow-up email that we send everyone who registered, and that'll come through in a few uh, within a few days. And we have been recording this webinar, so this will be published on our website and on our YouTube channel too, and you'll have access to that. Just before we go, we do have regular updates in the Commissioner's column, a fortnightly column put out by Commissioner Susan Pascoe. And, of course, our website has lots of guidance, podcasts, video content and webinars such as these. Please have a look at the webinar page and register for any upcoming topics you would be interested in. And our advice team phone number is 13ACNC, which is 132262 give those guys a call. They're very friendly and knowledgeable and they'll be able to help you out with as much as they can as far as the charity information goes. Or send us an email, advice at acnc.gov.au and we're pretty big on social media too. So if you want to follow us on either of those, please do so. Thanks everyone for um, your attention today and coming along to have a chat about tax over your lunch break. Thank you very much, Mel. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. No problem. We're always keen to get you guys in to answer these. Probably the most popular of all topics um, for our webinars is the tax one. So thanks very much for your help today. Thank you. And we'll send out the email to you all um, within a few days. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback about the webinar specifically or any other guidance or education stuff, send an email to education at acnc.gov.au. Otherwise, general queries about charity stuff um, and the stuff that we went over today, send the email to advice at acnc.gov.au. Thanks, everyone. We will stay on the line for a few minutes um, to answer the questions that are still coming through, but we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thanks. <laughs>